I'm Gabriela Fresquez, and this is Radar 2021. The Americans with Disabilities Act was passed just over three decades ago. The law, designed to ensure that people with disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else, has helped Americans gain better access to public spaces, transportation, and job opportunities. In my first day in office, I was proud to sign an executive order establishing a government-wide commitment to advancing equity, including people with disabilities. And while the ADA has been incredibly impactful, some feel it hasn't gone far enough. True equity for people with disabilities, whether for inclusivity or visibility, has proven to be an ongoing process. The DOT's Office of Aviation Consumer Protection told us they received 32 air transportation service animal complaints related to passengers with disabilities in January and February. U.S. Department of Transportation records shows about 880 formal complaints against airlines from people with disabilities over the course of a year, a nearly 10 percent increase from the same time period a year earlier. So, uh, airline industry, we're talking about you. How about, um, I don't know, training your employees to properly handle wheelchairs so that people like Ingracia Figueroa don't have to risk everything just to board a cross-country flight? As well-intentioned as the ADA may be, good intentions, like, say, when Marvel cast its first deaf superhero but failed to make the film widely accessible to actual deaf moviegoers, often fall short. And when that happens, it forces us to expand our understanding of inclusivity. And if you're at the intersection of disability, ethnicity, or any other marginalized group, the road to equity could be even steeper. I'm a 23-year-old disabled Latina youth organizer. I work specifically on the intersections of disability justice, the climate crisis, and gun violence prevention. I was born with, the, with cerebral palsy. I was diagnosed at the age of three, and I use a wheelchair to ambulate. Being a disabled Latina, I live in so many different intersections, but the thing that brings us all together is the fact that we live at the same um, multiple jeopardy situations. Disabled people experience racism, disabled people experience food inequality, uh, gender injustice. There isn't one intersection, whether you talk about reproductive justice, housing, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, that disabled people do not experience. And I think that that's what it, what is so special about our community that we, re we represent everyone and anyone can be part of our community. The intersection of race and disability is so, so important. And even during the Black Lives Matter protests that were happening over last summer, there was an effort to make known that, you know, Black disabled lives matter as well and that we are part of, um, we are part of that movement because disability and race simply cannot be disconnected. I also run my own nonprofit called Box the Ballot, which aims to increase youth voter turnout. I am an ambassador at the United Nations. I am an MZ MPH student, so really running the full gamut of things. And the intersection between all of those interests is public health and really utilizing um, public health to better our communities. Navigating the pandemic has been challenging, to say the least. But for people with disabilities, everyday obstacles were intensified. Pre-pandemic, almost half a million Americans, especially those with significant mental or physical impairments, relied on in-person social security field offices to get walk-in on-demand services. But in the wake of widespread office closures, people who rely on these services were pretty much left to fend for themselves. The ADA has made it possible for people with disabilities like me to have an equal chance to be a part of their communities and to be able to work just like everyone else. But like all things in life, it's not a cure all. We have a long way to go. And on average, nationally, people wait three years for services. And during those three years, we have that like service gap that can be detrimental to one's ability to have equal access. On the Build Back Better Bill, we're looking to make historic investments in these services to make sure that we minimize the waiting list. Those with Lawn Hauler Syndrome, I think they're calling it, who have lasting effects from getting COVID will be backed up by the ADA. So there are more people. Obviously, the media plays a role in raising awareness for disability issues. 
If it hadn't been for the nonstop coverage of the Free Britney movement, three specials on the topic, and the Britney Army social media militia all banding together, would my 14-year-old niece have become a conservatorship expert? Hard no. Also, that 14-year-old niece is me. But beyond the coverage of disability issues, how are we doing when it comes to representation inside newsroom workplaces themselves? I started writing uh, We're Not Broken largely because I felt that there was a lot of misinformation about autism, a lot of misunderstanding about autism. So basically, I traveled around the country to try to figure out how does our misunderstanding about autism affect people's daily lives. Some of the common myths are that, you know, there really are distinguishable differences between high functioning and low functioning autistic people and that those labels are the best. The idea that autism is something that happens only to white male adolescents. A big gap that I found, a big policy gap was how much or how little people understand how autism intersects with race and gender. I think that there still is a big gap in diagnoses when it comes to Latinos. I think our portrayal and our portraits of autism are still incredibly limited and exclude far too many people. And poor portrayals of autism begin bad ideas about autism. Autistic people can and often do advocate for themselves. I think what needs to happen is that neurotypicals need to take autistic people's voices seriously and not judge based on their perceptions about autism. When it comes to disability inclusion in film and television, Hollywood is still lagging. But recently, a report found that over the past decade, content featuring depictions of disability shot up more than 175%. Only the majority were played by performers without those disabilities. Funny how Hollywood seems to value the stories of people with disabilities without having a vested interest in actually employing them. Hi, my name is Danielle Perez. You may have seen me on Curb Your Enthusiasm or special on Netflix, or maybe you've seen me rolling down the aisles at Target and you've stopped to tell me that I'm brave. You go, girl. Because I use a wheelchair and don't have feet. I'm here with Gabby Frescas to talk about disabled representation in Hollywood, or rather the lack thereof. Non-disabled people should never play disabled characters in television and film. Okay, number one, you are taking jobs away from equally qualified and talented disabled actors. Okay, they're out there, let them shine. There's a long history of inspiration porn in film and television. Okay, we have A Walk to Remember, Mandy Moore has chronic illness, she has cancer, and that boy is so kind that he marries the disabled girl. <laughs> That's inspiration porn. It's showing disabled people as these noble beings that are superhuman. A show that did get it right is Ryan O'Connell's special on Netflix. Not only was the lead creator a disabled gay man, but he made it his mission to include as many disabled people. I got to recur on the second season and I play a bitchy prom queen, uh, typecast much? Hollywood, you may be saying to yourself, wow, that Janelle Perez is really mouthy and she's just ripped us a new one. But here are some things that you can do. Cast disabled people. Just because you don't have a character explicitly written as disabled, doesn't mean that a disabled person can't play them. Do ask us for what we need. We are more than happy to tell you how you can make the set and the writer's room more accessible. Do push your peers to also hire disabled talent. I will be optimistic when I sell my TV show. I'll let you know once Hollywood green lights that, and then you'll know that the tide has officially turned and disability is in fact in. So the next time you see me rolling in the aisle at Target, don't call me brave, but do have your people call my people. Sometimes career aspirations force us to carve out space for ourselves in a world where we've never seen ourselves reflected. It's a societal challenge that creatives and influencers are overcoming daily. Many people assume that since deaf people can't hear, that must mean that they can't drive, right? Because like, is, is, I mean, is that even legal? Because like, obviously you need to be able to hear your windshield wipers when it's raining, right? Right. So I was working at a coffee shop a few years back. Customers, people I worked with, they would be like, oh, so you can't hear everything I'm saying. They would become curious about like learning about what it's like 
to be a deaf person. I was like, how can I teach like a broader audience? So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna give YouTube a try. It was mind blowing to me because the amount of people that reached out to me and they were like, oh my gosh, your story's like mine. I was like, get out of here. Even though I wear hearing aids, when I meet somebody and they start talking, they just sound like they're talking some weird alien dialect underwater and I can't make it out. I'm really glad that I was able to find that voice when I was doing my YouTube channels. Now I'm focusing more on uh, TV writing and film writing for ideas that I have and just trying to create more roles for deaf people in the film industry. Let's say there's an astronaut. There's an, yeah, there's an audition for to be an astronaut. Just invite some deaf and hard of hearing people in and be like, hey, you can play an astronaut too. You don't have to just play the deaf person. I would love to see just more deaf and hard of hearing representation. Yo me llamo eh, Monica Elsa Victoria. Eh, yo, yo, tengo, eh, yo tengo 30 años. Yo doy clases de, clases de, este, de este ballet. Eh, también me ayuda para ser, para ser disi, disi, disciplinada. Eh, yo nunca parto mis clases, valer y también hacer activismo, las dos cosas. ¿Cómo fue tu experiencia haciendo la película La Laguna Rosa? No fue tan, tan, tan fácil, la parte de estudiar eh, diálogo y hacerlo muchas veces, ¿no? Pero lo hice bien. Lo más este, divertido es como si fuera a conocer actores nuevos. Las personas que tengan, que tengan discapacidad pueden Pueden hacer cosas, o sea, pueden hacer cosas lo que, lo que quieran, hacer actrices, hacer bailarines. También puede, eh, también es como llegar a una meta, a un sueño, porque eso es lo que, lo que tú quieres. Advocates and influencers have shown us through first person experiences what it's like to live with a disability. And many continue to dispel misconceptions about what those day to day experiences look and feel like. I went to school, uh, became a publicist after graduating, and I really sat with myself one day as I was pitching out clients, and I was like, you know what, it's so funny, I haven't had one client with a disability. One day to the next, I was creating pitches, and I was on photo shoots with the cane, and people started asking me, the cane is such a cool prop. And I'm like, oh my god, no, it's not a prop. It's like I needed to walk. Oh, it's like, like they actually thought, thought it was, was a, prop. a prop. Like it was just accessory in, in the pictures. And I was like, no, 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 no. I think essentially that's where people really realized that I was building a platform based on educating others about disability, inclusivity, diversity, and the self. I would say one of the things I faced throughout my whole life were people thinking that I owed them an explanation because I looked different. Having a disability is having a condition that limits your ability to interact in a social sphere, whether mentally or physically, but not only by the medical diagnosis. We have to realize that there are many societal infrastructures that limit us more to interact. I have cerebral palsy, which is a condition that affects a person's ability to move, maintain body alignment, and posture due to brain damage. Did you have any, maybe any role models or any people that you knew with cerebral palsy? I didn't, and I think that's one of the reasons why I kind of created this space, because growing up, you know, looking at the press and looking at models, magazines, I was always very into fashion. I saw no one that looked like me or that represented what a girl like me looked. Based from those experiences, I felt very responsible for creating a role model or a mentor or somebody that people can feel um, a connection with when it comes to not being seen. In, on this planet. When I got older into college, my sister and I, she would take me to classes and she would have to park in accessible parking. I had my placard um, and we would get harassed by the police. We would get harassed by elderly people and we would also get harassed 
by other disabled people who didn't know the full scope of disability. I got kind of fed up and I was like, I'm, I'm just gonna teach about, at first specifically spina bifida, so that other people can learn about my disability. Today's video, we're gonna talk about how I got my type of spina bifida. My dad was forced into the Vietnam War when he was very young. He came in contact with Agent Orange. The government was not supposed to use that chemical. They had talked about how it harms not only the environment, but people around it. The U.S. decided to do it anyway. And then in 1992, the year I was born, it was proven that Agent Orange can cause spina bifida in offsprings. I have to understand that while disability is natural, it's part of human uh, diversity. For me, it's not specifically because I'm a product of chemical warfare. I've been asking on Instagram people of what they want to see, what are some topics they're curious about, if I'm able to make it. Um, and I, I usually take from that and I try to make it mostly towards disabled people so that they can learn about themselves and how to advocate for themselves. Not every disability is obvious from an outsider's perspective. From long COVID to depression to a wide ranging spectrum of psychiatric disabilities. And sometimes having a disability can make someone vulnerable to being stripped of their agency. Britney Spears was under a probate conservatorship and was on represented by a court appointed attorney for most of the 13 year duration during her conservatorship. So the ARC, as well as a coalition of 25 other disability and civil rights organizations, we joined an amicus brief in order to be able to advocate for Britney Spears to select her own attorney. And that whole concept of supported decision-making would just allow a person to retain the legal rights while getting supported with the decisions that they are choosing from someone that they trust. We've been advocating for the rights of people with intellectual and developmental disability to participate to the maximum extent possible in making and executing decisions about themselves and to ensure their civil rights and human rights are retained and enforced. And in this scenario, regardless of conservatorship or guardianship status. Some disabilities, like the kind that occur by circumstance, can change someone's life suddenly and dramatically, forcing them to adapt to a world designed for the able-bodied practically overnight. Toda esta historia empieza cuando a mis 14 años, jugando basketball, recibo un golpe con otro jugador y empieza esta evolución o esta cosa en, en mi rodilla derecha. Digamos con mi, mi pediatra y, y él es el que nos dice, esto no es un hinchazón, esto es un tumor. Yo vencí el cáncer después del año y medio de tener quimioterapias. Pasé cinco años de vigilancia y ya pasé a una cuestión ortopédica. Estos problemas que me empezaron a generar fueron atrofia muscular, principios de osteoporosis, descalcificación de hueso, rechazo a cuerpo extraño. A los 23 años yo no aguantaba estar con ese castigo y fue cuando tomé la decisión de que me amputaran la pierna para ya poder liberarme, ser libre y empezar mi vida lo más normal posible, pero sobre todo feliz, libre y sin límites. Toda esta parte deportiva empieza en el 2008. Cuando Laura Vidal me invita a su fundación, me dice, oye, voy a hacer una carrera por los niños con cáncer. Van a ser 5 kilómetros, 10 kilómetros, y quiero que tú la corras. Cada año yo empecé a correr la carrera de, de aquí nadie se rinde. Después de 13 años de trayectoria deportiva, más de 107 carreras, más de 1,000 kilómetros recorridos en total, practicar crossfit, pesas, natación, Carreras planas desde 5 kilómetros hasta maratones, carreras campo traviesa, OCR, Spartan Race, ser conferencista, ingeniero en audio, músico, bailarín, de todo un poco. Hablar acerca de esta cuestión de la discapacidad es compartir un mensaje, una frase. Una persona con discapacidad no es aquella persona que le falta un brazo o una pierna, que no oye o que tiene un problema intelectual. Una persona con discapacidad es aquella persona que se niega a ver y aceptar la realidad. No somos personas pobrecitas, al contrario, es darnos la oportunidad como personas que somos todos, como seres humanos, de demostrar las capacidades que tenemos. In the U.S., where nearly a quarter of the population is disabled, only 1% of primetime ads actually feature people with disabilities. And to some extent, the challenges speak for themselves because how do you reach such a significant portion of the population with vastly unique needs with a singular approach or marketing strategy? The short answer is, you don't. My guess though, is that the solution lies in doing a little more listening and a little less talk. I think that because some 
communities within the disability community prefer person first language. There are people with intellectual disabilities. You see what I did there? I, I said a person with an intellectual disability. The autistic community has, you see what I did there? We, the, the autistic community tends to prefer identity first language. It's been a debate because some individuals really like to do it that way. And because I see my autism as a, a part of me. People with disabilities should have an insight and be able to tell us if they can, how they want to be referred to. I always tell people to, if you don't know how to label someone, you gotta ask, just go, just go ask them. I personally prefer the words either deaf or hard of hearing. That's, that's me. But just also like keep in mind that everyone's different. About a billion people, or 15% of the world's population, live with some kind of disability. And in recognition of Universal Human Rights Month and International Day of Persons with Disabilities, it's important to acknowledge the progress made since the ADA was passed over 30 years ago, as well as to take note of where there's still room for improvement, so we can hold leadership and ourselves accountable. Handicap, by definition, it states that you're not uh, capable of doing anything, whether physically or mentally. We should wipe that word out or come into terms of giving it a new meaning. The term highly used now and the phrase would be person with a disability. When we use the term, the word person, we are able to bring back that person to a human identity instead of a disabled person where we define that person as disabled first. Thanks for watching Radar 2021. Please like, subscribe, and comment down below and let us know what issues are important to you. Because let's be honest, there are a lot of issues to choose from. <laughs> so, so many.